How is it possible that the best performing stock of the last 30 years isn't a tech company? Well, companies like Amazon, Apple, and Nvidia have created billions of dollars worth of value by bringing new innovative tech to enterprise and consumer audiences, they still aren't number one. In fact, the best performing company of the last 30 years does one simple thing extremely well. They sell caffeinated sugar water. That slims your options down, but it isn't Coca-Cola or Pepsi. It's Monster Energy. Since their IPO in 1990, Monster has grown by almost 200,000%. To put this into perspective, if you invested $10,000 into Monster, you would have made 19.2 million. On the flip side, if you were to put $10,000 into Amazon, you'd get $1.4 million less. Now, of course, Monster started as a penny stock, so insane metrics like this are easy to hack. But this type of sustained success over a 30-year time frame is no fluke. How is this possible? Monster isn't just another Cinderella story for business owners to gawk at. In fact, there are four key lessons that, when implemented correctly, will amplify the momentum of your business. How does a company perform so well and get so little time in the spotlight? The news cycle is constantly dominated by titans of industry like Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, and Elon Musk. Yet we never hear about the founder of Monster. And while we're at it, who the hell even is the founder of Monster? Morgan and Morgan Law Firm is set to file more than 100 lawsuits against the makers of drinks like Monster. Tonight, a lawsuit alleges one of those energy drinks could be linked to a death. Beyond the spreadsheets and stock market, the birth of Monster is an amazing story of shrewd marketing efforts, endless controversy, fierce competition, and of course, sleepless nights. This is the secret history of Monster Energy. The monster we know today exists because of the iron will of one man. That man is Rodney Sachs. Now, if you've never heard of Rodney Sachs, don't be shocked. He keeps a relatively low profile and stays out of the news. He doesn't even have social media. It's nearly impossible to find any information on the 73-year-old billionaire. He's never taken an interview about his life and keeps a laser focus on building the monster brand, not his own personal brand. But once you do the research, you'll find that his story should be studied by every would-be entrepreneur. Rodney was born in 1949 in Johannesburg, South Africa to Jewish Lithuanian immigrants. Rodney had a typical South African upbringing and didn't really show any particular signs of being a future billionaire. He didn't go to fancy schools like Harvard or Stanford. Instead, he stayed in South Africa and studied law at a local university. But it was when he began his career, his true trajectory began to show itself. After graduation, he took a job at South Africa's largest corporate law firm and rose through the ranks like a rocket. During his tenure, he became the youngest person ever to be promoted to partner. He stayed for 20 years and eventually became a senior partner of the firm, where many would ride off into the sunset of their career. But not Rodney. Rodney had been to the top of the big law mountain. He'd achieved a level of prestige that law students spend their lives dreaming of. He then realized it wasn't for him. As Peter Thiel said, big law is a strange place. After years of devotion to his craft, Rodney had come to the same conclusion. He wanted to start fresh. So like many entrepreneurs, he packed up his belongings, his family, and his career and moved to Southern California. The year is 1989. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is one of the top movies of the year. The 49ers defeated the Bengals to win Super Bowl 23, And most importantly, the Berlin Wall fell, signaling the end of communism in continental Europe. Countries that once had barren grocery stores are now seeing rapid amounts of growth and new globally produced products. Quickly, one big winner starts dominating the fray. Red Bull gives you wings. Red Bull was the model of global success. The original Red Bull was named Krating Dang. It was a working class staple in Thailand. After some ingredient adaptations, carbonation, and intense marketing efforts, Red Bull became Europe's favorite drink. Clubs from Manchester to Munich stocked the beverage and it fueled a vibrant party scene. Well, it wasn't until 1996 and 1997 that Red Bull would sell its first can in America and South Africa, respectively, Rodney had noticed the trend and it piqued his interest. But Rodney was convinced his opportunities lay in another product category, smoothies. At the time, smoothies were huge in the US. Jamba Juice was one of the hottest brands in the country and lines were down the block. Rodney saw the chance to produce bottled smoothies that could be sold anywhere and everywhere. Gyms, convenience stores, swimming pools, and health stores. This would be his big catch. Only one issue stood in his way. Rodney owned nothing in the United States. So he did what any first-time entrepreneur would do and started raising money. Rodney and an associate went to their friends and family and raised $6 million to acquire a publicly traded shell company. This shell company would serve as a vessel to raise even more money and acquire an existing player. If Rodney wanted to bring a new smoothie product to market, he would need one thing and one thing only, distribution. 
On his own, he couldn't pull all the pieces together. There had to be a business out there that had a killer distribution network, but found itself on hard times. Rodney's big opportunity came to him through an introduction by an investment banker. The missing puzzle piece would be a business named Hanson's. Hanson's was a staple of old Hollywood. Established in 1935, Hanson's got their start providing juices to movie sets. The business was a family affair, and as a result, never became more than a regional success. They built more manufacturing facilities to get into different verticals like foods and sodas, but never quite reached nationwide popularity. In 1988, after a period of aggressive overexpansion, Hansons had to file for bankruptcy. They sold off their manufacturing capabilities to Tropicana to pay off some of the debts and had their name acquired by the California Co-Packers Corporation. While many would see Hansons as a dead company, Rodney saw a diamond in the rough. It had the one thing he needed, distribution. Hansons' pre-existing independent distribution network would give him a proper foundation to build his smoothie empire. All he needed to do was turn around the operation and launch the smoothie line. From there, it would be smooth sailing, or so he thought. So in 1992, with his heart set on Hanson's, Rodney and his partner purchased the business for a grand total of $14.5 million. Now, that's almost double the amount that Rodney and his associate raised. So how'd they get access to $14.5 million so quickly? The most likely answer is that the investment banker that they were working with set up an LBO, or leveraged buyout. Working with the bank, Rodney and co. took out debt to finance the acquisition. Remember how Elon worked with Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan Chase to purchase Twitter? Same principle. Before the ink dried, they were losing money by the minute and only had 12 employees. The first four years of his time as CEO included consolidating costs to put Hansons on the road to profitability. The launch of the smoothie line shortened the gap towards profitability. In the first nine months of sales in 1995, the smoothie line brought in one third of the company's revenue. The next year, Hansons was able to report a profit of $375,000. The very next year, Red Bull launched in the US and quickly became the number one player in the category, a title they still hold today. What had only slightly caught Rodney's attention before was now knocking on his door. The Hansen's executive team was excited about this new category and they quickly launched their own product. With minimal branding and a little bit of work in the lab, Rodney launched Hansen's Energy with a skinny 8.4 fluid ounce can in 1997 to some fanfare. But it wasn't a slam dunk success like Red Bull was. Over the course of the next couple years, Hansen's Energy spawned new flavors and energy blends. They tested out taurine, ginseng, and even creatine, which you've probably seen in modern energy drinks like Bang. While Hansen's Energy was a moderate success, it was being targeted to the wrong audience. Drinks were touted as functional beverages with near medicinal benefits. The drinks would supposedly fight aging or give consumers stamina. The company focused too much on the herbs and additives in their drinks and by association resonated with the health conscious market. What Red Bull knew was that the real money was in the 18 to 25 year old male market. Energy drinks struck the biggest chord with them and they would become almost like missionaries for the brand. After years of average performance with Hansen's Energy, Rodney went back to the drawing board and started thinking of ways to really compete with Red Bull. They needed a total makeover. Rodney and his team upped the caffeine content, increased the sugar, and hired a killer brand designer to give them something extreme. The result is the original monster. As opposed to the 8.4 ounce can Red Bull used, Monster sold 16 ounce cans. The insight was simple. This is America, bigger the better. You can't have a dainty little can and expect to win the 18 to 25 year old male market. You need something with some heft. Additionally, Hanson's offered retailers the same wholesale price as Red Bull, so they would sell for the same price on the shelf. As a consumer, you could either have the 8.4 fluid ounce European Red Bull, or you could have nearly double the size with the 16 ounce American Monster for the same exact price. It was a no brainer Alongside more value to the consumer, Monster began an all-out marketing blitz. On the retail front, Monster had amazing retail displays. These displays spoke to the extreme ethos of the brand and included elements like NASCAR, dirt bikes, and later on video games. The brand also made specialty coolers exclusively for storing Monster products. At scale, these types of activations add up, and Monster soon found themselves with great footing in retail. Monster was flying off the shelves. One business owner loved working with the brand so much that he commissioned a custom-built metal display rack for his gas station. But their efforts went beyond retail. Monster copied Red Bull's ambassador network and launched it on college campuses across the country. You couldn't go to class without an ambassador giving you a can of the new drink. 
However, the cornerstone of their strategy was in the form of promotions. The early marketing thesis for Monster was simple. If an 18-year-old guy in the 90s thought it was cool, then Monster would sponsor it. On the extreme sports side, Monster put their logos on all sorts of equipment, dirt bikes, skateboards, snowboards. Then they jumped into music. Acts like Suicidal Tendencies and Korn were given wristbands with the Monster logo and were paid to drink out of Monster cans on stage. But more often than not, they weren't even drinking Monster. They were drinking water just out of Monster cans. It was a great branding move. Monster became a massive part of the late 90s, early 2000s cultural zeitgeist, and their revenue reflected that. Going into the mid-2000s, Monster entered a period of rapid growth. The beast was finally unleashed. Hey Diecast, wanna pick me up? After the launch of Monster in 2002, Hanson's sales more than doubled and profits quadrupled. From that point forward, it was grind time for Rodney and the team. The most important objective? Building out the sales and marketing team to move more product. At the time of the launch of Monster, Hanson's employed 108 total employees, with the marketing and sales department housing about 66 employees. In 2005, that number jumped to 293 total employees, with 217 employees in marketing and sales. Just a huge amount of salespeople. That increased headcount came with increased growth. In 2005, Monster had captured 18% of the total energy drink market, and while Hanson's was still in Red Bull's shadow, they were on the path to eclipsing them with a growth rate of 3x more. Now was the time to put the pedal to the metal. Hanson's began experimenting with other flavors and brands to drive more revenue. Products like Joker Mad Energy, Roomba, Samba, Tango, and Lost Energy hit shelves across the nation, but delivered mild results. Joker was nearly identical to Monster with two changes. One, there was a slight variation in taste, and two, it was only sold in Circle K convenience stores. Joker was more of a success for Circle K than it was for Monster, so the brand was sold off to the convenience store chain in 2010. But that wasn't the only fat being trimmed in 2010. After years of low sales, Monster discontinued the product line and Roomba, Samba, and Tango were no more. Lost Energy was discontinued the same year. The problem with all these beverages was that they weren't standout hits like the original Monster. Hanson's had spent a fortune building brand equity with their Monster name, so why not use it? The only way to launch new and successful products was to stay under the brand umbrella. Drinks like Monster's Zero Sugar and Monster's Zero Carb were aimed at the health-conscious crowd that were originally captivated by Hanson's energy. Monster Java and Monster Rehab took notes from Roomba, Samba, and Tango, released coffee and tea blends to become part of consumers' morning routines. The executive team realized they didn't have to rely on other brands like Lost to sell their product. Monster had the brand that moved the product. They stuck to the Monster brand, and now all of these products are successful and still around today. In a final changing of the guard, in 2011, the business ditched the Hanson's name and became Monster Energy. They found something that worked and they were going to stick to it. More shelf space for Monster turned into more lines of revenue and Monster was entering its heyday. But that success came at a cost. We've all heard it before, the energy drinks were the best thing for your health, but now some say they may be killing you. Is there a consideration to putting an age restriction on energy drinks? Absolutely. We're looking at the possibility of defining it as 18 or older or 19 or older. It's the number of people who go to the emergency room after drinking energy drinks has doubled. Monster was thrust into a big controversy as public health concerns began to dominate the airwaves. Regulators and the media were going for their throats. It wasn't long before Rodney Sachs found himself in a congressional hearing explaining the safety of his beverages to bureaucrats. But this regulatory attention only played into Monster's hand. Monster became edgy. All of a sudden, Monster was the drink your parents, your teachers, and your congressional representatives didn't want you drinking. Monster's target demo loved that. They liked being part of something that felt countercultural. But Monster was only getting started. After the hearing, the FDA issued a letter stating that they would not be taking any action against Monster or any other energy drink brands. Monster's shares surged 13% upward. Without the regulators on their back, Monster began to mature and grow as a brand. In 2014, Monster had finally reached full maturity, and Coca-Cola signed a deal to acquire a 16.7% stake in Monster for a total sum of $2.15 billion and become Monster's primary distributor. This wasn't a defensive move against regulators, but rather an offensive move to keep increasing Monster's growth. In the world of beverages, Coke has the single best distribution network ever. The saying used to be, all roads lead to Rome, but today, it's more like all roads lead to a Coke distributor. This move embedded Monster into Coke's international distribution system in a way that would pour gasoline on Monster's international growth. In other words, Monster now had the tools to take on Red Bull around the world, all thanks to Coke. Monster isn't just another Cinderella story for business owners to gawk at. In fact, there are four key lessons that, when implemented correctly, will amplify the momentum of your business. 
The first lesson is brand adherence. Branding is a big deal. Imagine this scenario. If Nike announced they were going to open a hotel, you'd have a clear idea of what that would look like. There would be an awesome gym, a massive sports memorabilia museum, and expert taught fitness classes available around the clock. That's the power of a real brand. Now, imagine if Hyatt Hotels said they were going to make a shoe. I couldn't even tell you what color the shoe would be. In this situation, Hanson's was Hyatt and Monster was Nike. Remember back to the launch of Hanson's Natural Energy? While the energy drink market was wide open for opportunity, Hanson's energy just didn't speak to the target consumer. The product landed flat on its face. Now, remember when Monster launched their first new products outside of the original Monster? Those weird brands you've never heard of, like Tango and Samba? Similar to Hanson's Natural Energy, the branding didn't entice target consumers enough and the products were a flop. Develop a damn good brand and stick to it. Lesson number two, distribution is as, if not more, important than product. At every turning point in Monster's history, there was a clear focus on distribution. Think back to when Rodney was looking to acquire a business. He didn't buy Hanson's because the name sounded nice or he was interested in the history of the company. He bought Hanson's because they had everything he needed to build a successful smoothie brand, a solid distribution network. Then with the launch of Monster, distributors made sure to set up eye-catching retail displays and price Monster competitively with Red Bull. That launch was a sink or swim moment and the distributors were like a life preserver for the brand. Now with Monster, Monster is a mature brand, they're partnering with Coke, the world's best beverage distributor, to take a swing at the number one energy brand. Third lesson, go where your customers are. Monster's early successes partially stem from its elite marketing, but their process wasn't very complicated. If anything, it was ultra simple. Monster built its entire brand and marketing strategy around its customers. While Red Bull had mastered what European 18 to 25 year old males liked, they didn't have an intimate understanding of the US consumer like Monster did. Monster was sponsoring everything an 18 year old in the 90s would think was cool. Working backwards, Monster identified their target customer, 18 to 25 year old males, and then asked themselves what does this demographic like and where do they hang out? From there, they spent money making sure that there wouldn't be any 18 to 25 year olds who didn't know what Monster was. By focusing so intently on their customers, Monster built more than a drink brand. They built a cultural force deciding what was and wasn't cool. But there's a big question of how. How did Rodney know what would resonate with 18 to 25 year old American males? When Rodney bought Hanson's in 92, he was a 42 year old lawyer from South Africa. He wasn't some snowboarding, skateboarding, BMX riding rock star. He was just a guy who practiced corporate tax law, arguably one of the most uncool areas for someone to work in. How did he know what would be cool? How did he build Monster into a cultural arbiter? This brings us to our fourth and final lesson the importance of an open culture. Rodney rarely gives interviews. In fact, finding any information about him online is a massive struggle. As I said before, Rodney keeps a very low profile. He has no social media accounts, but in 2011, Rodney gave beverageindustry.com a tell-all and went no holds barred. In it, he gives away the secret of Monster's success. He says, everyone is able to share their views and make recommendations from the most junior guys up. We think everybody should be able to express their views and they should be respected. When people say, how do you come up with new products? We listen to the younger guys. A lot of them are internal. What are they doing? What do they like? When we test our packaging and promotions, we run it by the younger guys. The key to finding the right product or packaging for the right demographic is hearing what they say and understanding them in their own environment as opposed to trying to figure out what an artificial focus panel says. But that's not the end. If we stop there, the story is that Rodney built Monster into a powerhouse brand, partnered with Coca-Cola, and then rode off into the sunset, while fitting for a novel, that's just not the reality. The last couple of years have seen heightened competition in the energy drink market from all directions. Red Bull is still the dominant player in the arena with 42.5% market share in the US, while new entrants are springing up by the day. The new kid on the block to watch is Celsius. Focused on serving fitness enthusiasts, their drink provides more caffeine than a Monster while at a fraction of the calories. Celsius is owned by PepsiCo, so they're directly at odds with Monster. However, Rodney has a plan. He's going to take the market by force, starting with Bang Energy. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Bang, they serve the same customer segment as Celsius, but with more aggressive marketing and more caffeine. Basically, an updated and modernized monster. Their branding is loud and out there, and the caffeine content of one can of Bang is equivalent to two cans of Monster. But what sets them apart from the rest of the market is their heavy investment in influencer promotions. In 2022, Bang Energy spent the most on YouTube brand partnerships of any company in the food and beverage category. But their focus isn't just on YouTube, they're also crushing TikTok. The 
company's official hashtag, Bang Energy, has close to 20 billion views. Leading the company is Jack Owak, who is the brand personified. He wears gaudy pattern shirts paired with large Bang logo chains and is always stirring up controversy. Remember folks, if you ain't training, you ain't gaining. If you ain't banging, you ain't hanging. Does this say yes to the dress or say yes to the breast? <laughs> So if you have a creatine peptide, you can solve mental retardation as we age. Now, you don't have to be an expert in FDA regulation to guess that Jack's statements might cross a line. But it wasn't regulators that took him to bat over it. It was Monster. Back in September of 2018, Monster sued Bang Energy, alleging that the company was intentionally misleading customers and fraudulently hyping up the benefits of its super creatine. The case was a home run for Monster, and in September of last year, Bang was forced to pay $293 million straight to Monster. This may have been a bump in the road if PepsiCo, Bang's former distributor, wasn't also awarded a $115 million settlement from Bang. The company was in too deep. With all of these settlements adding up, Bang had to declare Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They were in a rough spot and they were close to shutting their doors, but this wasn't the end of Bang's story. Guess who was there to pick up the pieces? Rodney. In July, a judge gave the green light to the acquisition of Bang Energy by Monster Energy, allowing Bang to steer clear of Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Monster now owns one of the hottest names in the market, and they were able to buy it at a discount because of the shrewd legal moves. The stages are set for Celsius and Bang to clash, but if I were Rodney, I'd be careful. Do you remember how I said Monster was the best performing stock of the last 30 years? Well, with the help of the PepsiCo acquisition, Celsius is the best performing stock of the last five years. I'm doing a whole series on these kinds of businesses, so subscribe if you want to see more. And thanks for watching.